fast to the word of God. Titus chapter 1 verses 1 to 16. Titus, like Timothy, was one of Paul's young protege. Some time between his first imprisonment and his second imprisonment in Rome, Paul had gone with Titus to the island of Crete to establish a church and he left him there to continue on the work of establishing a church and its leadership. While Timothy was dealing with the difficult people at Ephesus and the threat of Nero's direct persecution of the church, Titus on the Isle of Crete had his hands full also. Unlike Timothy, Titus was not timid, nor did he suffer from physical ailments. Though a close friend, they appeared to be two opposites. Titus, like Timothy, became discouraged at this time in history. The Cretes, by their very nature, were difficult people with whom to work with. Paul writes to encourage this young man. Bible scholars believe that Paul, this is Paul's second last letter, which was probably written prior to Paul's final imprisonment and martyrdom at Rome. In 1876, President Grant sent a message to Sunday School Teachers Times. My advice to Sunday School Teachers, no matter what their dom domination is, to hold fast to the Bible as an anchor of your liberties. Write the precepts on your heart and practice them in your lives. To the influence of this book, we are in debt for all the progress made to true civilization. And to this we must look as our guide and future. Righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Yours respectively, U.S. Grant. President Grant encouraged the young Christian leaders of his day to hold fast to the Bible as an anchor of your liberties. In the midst of all of Titus' trouble, Paul encourages young man Titus and young leaders to face all opposition, to hold fast and have a strong and firm grip on the Word of God, for it is the anchor of our eternal souls. Section A, Open Greetings to Titus, Diamonds in the Dust, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. There's an amazing story told about 1866 of the discovery of the world's greatest diamond mines in South Africa that came to light amongst people who were previously unaware of them. A man by the name of Van Niekerk was out walking and he found some stones that looked like diamonds lying on the ground. He pointed it out to those around about him. Don't be ridiculous, they replied. Diamonds in the dust, there to pick up. Don't be a fool. But Van Dieker was not put off and eventually sent the diamonds to a famous geologist by the name of Dr. Atten. The geologist was skeptical at first, but like a true scientist, he did all the tests and was astonished to find that indeed they were first-class diamonds valued at 500 pounds or $1,000 in 1870. A great deal of money. Van Niekerk and his friend O'Reilly went back to where they'd found them and made an absolute fortune. The diamonds were there all the time, but people passed them over because they didn't know the truth about them. Sadly, we often treat the opening verses of the greetings of Paul and other writers in scriptures as having very little value to us personally. The opening verses to Titus are amongst Paul's longest greetings, yet just Take a moment to stop and to consider what is before us and we will discover some of God's precious diamonds that will enrich our lives for they are remarkably rich with the truths and blessings of God. Verse 1. Paul begins by saying that he's a bondservant of God. And the word servant in the Greek here means a bondservant or slave. Paul is not using the term to imply involuntary ser servitude but rather to show how his life and will is totally surrendered to God. Just as a slave has given him themselves wholly to the will of their master, so Paul has given over his will to God's will. He has lain all at the feet of Christ. Paul's life revolves 100% around the Lord. The title slave or bondservant is a mixture of genuine humility and le legitimate pride. For it was a life given to the prophet, or it was a title given to the prophets of God and great leaders of Israel such as Moses and Joshua. His position as a slave of God is not something new for in fact it was or it has a long history of distinction. Paul proudly stands in a great line of succession and so does each one of us who have experienced the wonderful magnificent grace of God. Next he tells us that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ meaning that he's an apostle who is on a special mission for a higher authority. The purpose of Paul's servitude and mission was first to help according to the faith of God's elect. Paul does not use the term elect, meaning that some are destined to be saved and others are not. 
And the phrase in no way removes our responsibility as free moral agents. Rather, firstly, he uses the term as a link to the historical concept of his title as a servant or a slave. But used by the prophets of God to show that the message that he preaches did not spring out of nowhere, but out of the deep, rich heritage of the Old Testament, in which God's love was not only expressed to Israel, but to all of humanity. Secondly, he used the term to define the scope of his ministry, which is to waken humanity to the message of grace and to nurture the faith of those in Christ. Finally, the word elect carries with it the concept and promise of purpose that for a Christian, life is not aimlessly bouncing off circumstances like a pinball in a pinball machine, but rather has true purpose. The second part of Paul's missionary mission is to impart knowledge of truth to the saints. The Christian message is not uncertain or full of vague speculations or feel-good quotations, but rather is built upon the truth of God's word. Paul's duty as an apostle is to equip the saints with the knowledge of the truth of the gospel and the Christian life. Christian evangelism and education must go hand in hand. Jesus told us to go and to make disciples of every nation. The knowledge of such truth can result in the demonstration of true Christian profession of life, which is godliness or God-centeredness. Someone once said that godliness is the flower which only comes from the seed of truth. Verse 2. Here Paul deals with another purpose of his apostleship, which is the promotion of our hope of eternal life. The song, Impossible Dream, from the musical Man of La Mancha was written by Mitchell Lee and Joe Darren, has inspired and thrilled audience across the world. The words describe the triumph for fortitude that pursues an impossible dream, that in the face of great obstacles never despairs, never loses hope, never gives up in order to make the world a better place, enduring until success has achieved. Hope, as viewed here, is the energizing cause of Paul's apostolic ministry and the devotion and service of our lives. Hope is viewed as an inspiration of our faithfulness in the performance of God's will in our lives and holy living. Inspiration is critical for human life. Without inspiration, nothing happens. No great achievement is accomplished, no great knowledge gained, no lasting truth acquired. According to studies undertaken by Thomas, Davison, and Barber, inspiration is directly linked to self-worth and achievement. Low self-worth can result in a loss of confidence, desire to give up on achieving anything, loss of hope and withdrawal from a project. On the other hand, inspiration raises a person's self-worth, which results in high achievement and involvement in the project or mission of the organization. Our earnest expectation our hope of eternal life is grounded on two things. First, that God cannot lie, which literally means that God is unliable. And secondly, the promise of God before time. The apostle applies to God this unusual epitaph to bring out the absolute trustworthiness of the hope just mentioned. Paul's emphasis is on the trustworthiness of God and God's inability to lie because historically, Cretans had acquired a reputation of being liars. The Cretans, after the decline of the Minoan Empire and political influence, needed to bring trade and prosperity back to the island. And a lie helped them to achieve this. The lie was to claim that the tomb of Zeus, the lord of the gods, was on Crete. The lie was so successful that Crete soon returned to being a prosperous island. Unfortunately, this event created a significant predecessor in the national mindset that lying was the way to get your own way. And in the 6th century, Epimendides, himself a Cretan, said even one of their own prophets said, all Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. Spiritually, the island became a hotbed of false teachers and error which was readily accepted by all. At the outset of this letter, using the truth of the gospel, Paul tackles the national characteristics of lying. 
by assuring the church at Crete and also us that our hope is rooted in God's promise made before eternity and creation came into being. Paul therefore sees our hope as the energizing power that not only initiates but maintains godliness in our lives. Verse 3. Paul recognizes that the manifestation of the reality of this promise of eternal life came in as in God's good time at the coming of Christ. Yet he is also deeply aware of the fact that the continuation of the manifestation of this promise lies chiefly in preaching, which is a command from God our Saviour that has been entrusted unto him personally. The, the Greek word for preaching here denotes the proclamation of a herald. And as before, it is in every generation, the world needs great preachers who are stirred up with the Holy Spirit to stir people back to God. Where preaching is emphasized and valued by the ministry, people come and listen again and again. Griffith Thomas said these words, Let us be firmly convinced of and deeply impressed with the absolute necessity, the supreme importance, the profound influence, and the great joy of preaching the gospel. Now this does not mean that Paul saw himself as the only preacher of the gospel, but rather that he personally aware of his own contribution in the area of preaching and of the need to fulfill his personal responsibility as an apostle and servant of God. Verse 4. After a rather lengthy introduction, Paul's thoughts now center on Titus. Recalling that Titus is one of Paul's own converts, he said, to Titus, a true son or genuine son, in our common faith meaning that Titus and Paul had the same objective of faith, Jesus Christ and the same end of faith, eternal life. Titus comes down through history as a man with gifts of diplomacy, organization and leadership. It seems that Titus was one of Paul's troubleshooters. He was sent to Corinth to sort out the collection of money for the saints, the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, who were suffering at that time by a great famine in that part of the world, as well as the persecution from their fellow Jews. And now he's sent to Crete to guide the church in true faith. Thank God for men and women of such godly character. Paul then prays that Titus and his readers would receive two blessings from God the Father and Jesus Christ. The first blessing is grace, which refers to the eternal fountain of goodness of God. And the second blessing is peace, which is the consciousness of the reconciliation of the work of God in our lives through Jesus Christ that safeguards our hearts and minds in these times. Mercy is not found in the original manuscripts and seems to be added to comply with Paul's other greetings in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Section B, Qualifications of Church Officials, chapter 1 verses 5 to 9. Evidently the churches on the Isle of Crete were in rather a disorganized mess and Paul had to visit the island with Titus to set things in order. Since there is no record in Acts of Paul visiting the island of Crete with Titus, we assume the visit took place between Paul's first and second imprisonment. For some reason Paul had to leave the island early and he left Titus in charge to set things in order. Titus is left with two duties. First, he's to set in order the things that are lacking. And the words set in order in the Greek were the words used in, by medical writers for setting bones or for straightening out crooked ones. Uh, and so it's therefore d d difficult to assess what uh, Paul meant by the charge. However, judging by the general flow of the letter, it could refer to Titus' duty of straightening out with pure doctrine, people who had been perverted by false teachers. Timothy's second duty is to appoint elders in every city. It seems that the church at Crete lacked effective leadership and probably because of false teachers, and it was Titus' job to set up effective leaders. The fact that these qualifications are also in 1 Timothy chapter 3 would indicate that both sets of instructions were given around the same time. For instructions, definitions, turn to YouTube on 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 to 13. Section C, the Cretan false teachers, chapter 1, verses 10 to 16. 
Titus had quite a problem on his hands, for lying was part of the national mindset of the Cretans. They lied about everything, and this lying and deception made them particularly vulnerable to false teachers. This deadly combination was infiltrating its way into the church and destroying the work of grace. Section 1, A Picture of False Teachers, chapter 1, verses 10 to 39, verses 10 to 11. Paul says that there are many insubordinates or rebellious people. Satan had flooded the island of Crete and the church with false teachers and their inheritance. Now the word insubordinate in the Greek was a word used to describe a disloyal soldier who refused to take orders from his commander. So the word implied that these ones were refusing to follow the teachings of the church. Isaiah 59, 19 says, When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The way such a standard is lifted up is by holding fast to the Word of God. Not only are these false teachers a rebellious lot, but they are idle talkers, which in the Greek describes talk that does not accomplish anything. The Jews use the word to describe heathen worship which, which produce no goodness in life. Talkers were very common in Crete and also amongst the church. There's also a similar character in the classic novel Pilgrim's Progress called Talkative. As Christian and Faithful are walking along, Talkative comes up and engages them in dialogue. The Faithful is enjoying the conversation, but he notices that Christian is quiet and is walking several feet away. While Faithful likes Talkative, Christian is more perceptive when he says that this man with whom you are so taken will charm with his tongue 20 people who don't know him. Faithful eventually sees that talkative is full of words but is empty in heart. Christian advises that the best way to get rid of him is to begin a serious discussion about spiritual matters. And sure enough, talkative doesn't want to talk about that, which is really important, and he says goodbye. Christian is pleased with Faithful's straightforward style and says something that sounds a lot like Paul's teaching to Titus. It was a good thing for you to talk with him plainly as you did. I wish everyone would deal with them as you've done. Then they would either conform to Christianity or choose not to remain. These false teachers talk for no other reason than to control people. Paul calls them deceivers, which in the Greek means that their teaching is more than seductive. That is, it also is a powerful, uh, perilous fascination over the minds of its victims. These false teachers have a very clear strategy by which to take advantage of Christian, Christian hospitality and the desire to know God's word. They move from house to house, subverting whole households, which means that their teaching disrupts entire, fa entire families, turning them topsy-turvy in the Christian faith and causing rifts and other such things in a family. We see from Paul's words in verse 10 that the teaching of these false teachers stems from Judaism and Jewish religious rituals. He says that they are from the circumcision. And Paul also tells us in verse 10 that there were quite a number of them as he says there were many. Paul gives, some, gives Timothy some very strong instructions concerning these false teachers. He says in verse 11 that they are to have their mouths stopped. The thought is of muzzling a dangerous wild dog. Some people have the idea that the church is an open democracy, that anyone is allowed to say what they want as they please. And as Paul makes it quite clear that this is not always so, particularly in the case of false teachers. They are to be muzzled the way you would muzzle a wild dog. 12 to 39. Paul supports his statement by first quoting from a Cretan prophet or philosopher, Epimendes, who lived about 600 BC, whom they honoured and whom, whom described the Cretans as liars. Evidently, they were such chronic liars that the Cretans actually formed a word called Cretanizer, which actually meant to lie or to cheat. Paul describes them as evil beasts and wild beasts. And it was reported to have been sent by the prophet Epimendes that the lack of wild beasts on Crete was made up by the savagery of the Cretans themselves. And Paul describes them as being gluttons. The Roman historian Livery uh, records that they were powerful drinkers. And 
Paul adds his own personal experience in verse 13, writing that he had found the Cretans difficult people to handle. Section 2, the necessity of godly rebuke, verses 13b to 14. These verses carry with them not only a sense of urgency, but also of action. Titus must not hesitate, but move quickly and decisively. Not only must he use verbal correction to correct the false teachers, but also those who have swallowed their teaching hook, line and sinker. Paul tells Timothy to rebuke them sharply. The Greek word for sharply basically means to cut with a knife. And as a surgeon's knife cuts away diseases from the flesh, so Titus' words is to cut away the views of false teachers who had come into the church at Crete. Paul viewed the teachings of these false teachers which said you needed more than Christ and more than the grace of God to be saved, that you needed Jewish fables and commandments of men as being a horrible disease that needed to be quickly cut out of the body of Christ lest the infection affected all of the church. The Greek word for sharply also describes the picture of someone knocking down the door with an axe when a house is on fire to save occupants. And so we see that Titus is to break down the door of false teaching in order to save those who are trapped by it, thus bringing them into eternal life. We find in verse 13 that the purpose of Titus' rebuke of those false teachers is not to have them cast out of the church, but to have them restored and made spiritually well again. Paul says that they may have may be sound in the faith. So the word sound in the Greek basically means to be healthy. So Titus is to be like a spiritual doctor restoring both the false teachers and their victims to spiritual health. In verse 14, we see the importance of a church leader knowing the scriptures because it's only through the skillful knowledge of the word of God, guided by the Holy Spirit, that a well-crafted rebuke will helpfully dissuade false teachers and those believers who've been caught up in such heresies from following or paying attention to these popular Jewish myths or commands that add that are required as, added as a means to salvation. At the heart of Jewish ceremonialism and good works is the preparation of the coming of the Messiah. For the Jews believed it was only through the performing of good works that the Messiah would come. Such teaching denies Jesus as the Messiah and the Saviour of the world and completely undermines the hope and truth of the gospel. Works then become the central platform of salvation, not the grace of God. And Paul states in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Section 3, Commendation of False Teachers. Chapter 1, verses 15 to 16. John Calvin wrote that overseers or pastors need two voices, one to gather sheep and the other to drive away wolves and thieves. Verse 15. Part of the teaching of false teachers was that one could be made clean or pure by obeying Jewish ceremonies, which included a great list of religious washings and absences from certain kinds of food. Though such actions did promote healthy lifestyle and explain why the Jews were much healthier than the Gentiles, they didn't contribute one iota to inner purity and sanctification. Paul points out that Jewish ceremonialism cannot make a person pure. Isaiah the prophet says in Isaiah 64 verse 6, tells us that all good works are like filthy rags before God. Righteousness before God can only be given or bestowed upon us through the work of Christ at Calvary. These false teachers taught that if a person ate certain foods and did not touch certain things, they would be morally, morally pure. Paul plainly points out that if a person's conscience is not pure, then everything they touch defiles them. That is, if an unbeliever eats good food and that food becomes defiled, because it gives them strength to go and to do evil deeds. 
Nothing that an unbeliever touches remains pure because their thoughts and motives are at cross purpose with God's. And no amount of Jewish ceremonialism or any other ceremonies or good works will change that fact. Verse 16. Paul tells Titus that those who follow Jewish ceremonialism give the appearance of knowing God. But if you watch them carefully, you will see that their lives deny God. The actions of these false teachers deny the fact that Christ has already come and denying this fact shows that they don't know the scriptures. That these Jewish false teachers' minds are just as blind to the truth as their pagan counterparts are who worship idols. Paul then goes on to show the extent to which their lives deny God and aligning themselves with those who deny the very existence of God and practice idolatry. He says that they are abominable, uh, which, it, which has a strong sacrilege overtone, as one of the group of words used in connection with blasphemy and accusations of idolatry. It seems that the lives of these false teachers were so defiled that they blasphemed God in their very actions of imposing on people religious ceremonies and rituals for salvation. Now, these Jewish false teachers said they knew the scriptures, but their actions were disobedient, being willfully turning away from the truth and away from the voice of God. Paul says that the consequences are that every one of their good works are, was disqualified, which in the Greek means useless. And the word was used to describe counterfeit coins which were below the standard weight, thus meaning that every good work or every deed of the false teachers and those caught up in the false teachings became useless because it is counterfeit and therefore has no lasting value in the eyes of God. In these closing verses, we see Paul's pastoral concern for those who are under his care, and it appears that those of these particular false teachers, along with the victims, had once known the truth of the gospel. For this reason, Titus and all church workers must not only rebuke such people, but must make every effort to restore them to health, as this will only come by holding fast to the word of God. Conclusion. Don Carson stated, Where there is no passion for the word of God, other passions take over. This is beautifully captured in the painting by the pre-Raphael artist William Holman Hunt in a painting titled the Highland Shepherd in 1851. Now the subject of William Holman Hunt's The Highland Shepherd was actually taken from King, uh, from William Shakespeare's play, King Lear. And in the play, a character uh, called Edgar sings a song about a shepherd neglecting his flock and Hunt used the song as an inspiration for his work. At first glance, the viewer is presented with an idealistic setting, rolling hills, and dotted with sheep, a happy young couple, a winding stream, and a field of golden wheat. But on closer inspection, we see the deception into which the young man has fallen. The young girl has completely consumed his passion to the point that he's totally neglecting his work and seems oblivious to what is happening to his flock. On the left side of the canvas, we see a number of sheep lying helpless in the grass either lame or too sick to get up. On the right part of the canvas, a sheep have broken through the boundaries and wandered across the stream and are eating what's called barley corn. This type of corn is not good for sheep. And you'll see there's a lamb resting on the girl's lap and it's eating green apples, which will make it very sick as well. The girl, who at first glance seems to be happy, relaxing in the grass with the shepherd boy, actually looks a little uneasy. The shepherd boy who's showing her something. It's a death head moth. According to Hulman Hunt's own description of his painting, the young shepherd represents muddle-headed pastor who instead of performing their service to their flock, which is in constant peril, using their gifts of preaching to instruct and to care for those in their care, but are discussing vain questions of no value to the human soul. Now, Titus is told to hold fast to the Word of God. That is, to have an unswavering passion for it, that nothing must distract his attention to its abiding truth. Under no circumstances is he or any leader of the church or believer to let it slip from their hands. 
The church leader must not let the church be robbed of the eternal value of God's word by flattery words or fashionable arguments as though sheep were robbed of their true nourishment because of that young shepherd's empty discussion about a moth. A true church leader does not toy with eternal truths of the word of God but teaches them clearly and without compromise both rebuking and restoring to full spiritual health those that have been deceived by false teachers.